And so thank you for hearing that. And let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar. It's a joint presentation uh, today from Merit CX and Buck entitled The New Social Contract, Proven Employee Engagement Strategies That Reinvigorate the Customer Experience. My name is Tom Evans, and I'll be moderating this event. And joining me today on the program are three outstanding presenters, Stacy Bolger from Merit CX and our friends from Buck, Betsy Woods Brooks and Scott Mercott. And I'll introduce these three more formally in just a minute. But before I do, some answers to our most frequently asked questions, and those are, is this webinar being recorded, and will there be a time for Q&A at the end of today's presentation? The answer is yes. The event is being recorded, and you will receive a link within 24 hours of today's presentation. And if you'd like to ask a question during today's webinar, uh, simply type it in that question box on your screen, and I'll do my best to get that in front of our presenters during that time. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and meet our three presenters uh, for today. Uh, and kicking us off will be Stacy Bolger. Stacy serves as uh, Vice President Employee Experience for Merit CX, and in this role, she provides vision and guidance to Merit CX clients, helping them with solution design, go-to-market strategy, and sales enablement. Her ex expertise offers clients a holistic employee experience solution that is dynamic and supportive of their people, strategies, and initiatives. Uh, prior to joining Merit CX, Stacy spent 15 years in leadership roles as a CX and EX practitioner. She has a business degree from Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She is on the board of directors for the Western Wisconsin Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, and she is a member of the Customer Experience Professionals Association, the CXPA. So thank you, Stacy, for joining us today. And now our friends from Buck, we have Betsy Woods Brooks, and Betsy is principal is a principal in Buck's engagement practice where she works with clients to develop and implement end-to-end -end marketing communication strategies aimed at improving the well-being of employees and their families. She has extensive experience in all aspects of communication and change management from employee sensing to media strategy and messaging all the way to implementation and measurement. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Sacred Heart University. She is Six Sigma Green Belt, and she is certified in Total Quality Management, TQM. And then finally, we have Scott Marcotte with us today. Scott is Buck's Chief Technology Officer, and for the last 29 years, he has helped organizations solve human resources challenges through the strategic use of data, communication, and technology. He holds a Certified Employee Benefit Specialist degree. He has co-authored a book on employee engagement. He was named Xerox's Innovator of the Year, and he is a regular presenter at global HR conferences. Uh, and in his spare time, Scott leads Northwestern University's efforts on alumni engagement. He serves as president of the Illinois, Illinois Fatherhood Initiative. And then, of course, um, he's, why not? He's a press box play-by-play -play announcer for the Chicago Bears. Uh, so thanks for squeezing us in, Scott. That's great. Um, so that's a little bit about everybody. All of our speakers are highly qualified presenters. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Stacey Bulger from Merit CX. Thank you, Tom. And good morning and good afternoon to all of you, wherever you are joining us from today. Uh, we are so glad to have you joining us. So thank you for taking time out of your day to do that. <clears throat> All right, so I was on site with a client yesterday, and this client has been doing this CX thing, quote unquote, right, for over a decade, and has programs across our organization that are actually quite mature and very impactful um, on the, on the uh, ability and growth of their organization. And we were discussing what, what was next for them, particularly given that they're a very data-rich organization. And we found ourselves speaking uh, about the, the bulk of the time, in fact, that we spent was about the connection between employees and customers. And so for the next 60 minutes, we're going to entertain a similar discussion here with you. And as customer experience or CX professionals, it, it may feel at times a bit employee experience or EX heavy, but I encourage you and challenge you to hang with us um, because this EX lens is one that is really critical for us to understand if we're truly going to take our CX programs to the next level. So it's not usual for organizations as we, and I think we can all relate to this, uh, to be committed to understanding the role, not just of customers, but also the role that employees play in driving business outcomes. 
But more often than not, and I, I would expect if I was sitting in a room in front of you, I might see some head, heads nod. This is done in a very siloed fashion. And as an industry, we've been talking about the relationship between employee engagement and customer loyalty for many, many years, <laughs> as we can see here, uh, the mid-1980s being referenced. Uh, and even recent data uh, from Harvard Business Reviews, Review excuse me, suggests that uh, when organizations have both engaged customers and engaged employees, uh, the, they are going to reap the benefits in, in key business outcomes. And in fact, uh, Merit CX uh, was also on the forefront uh, of recognizing that engaged employees drove better business results. Um, across our family of companies, uh, we see that the business model of several of our companies is based on this idea, this notion of understanding and leveraging what drives and motivates uh, human behavior within the workplace. So I have to ask then why if this concept of happy employees equals happy customers and vice versa very often, if it's not new and it has been around for well over a quarter of a century, why is it so difficult to get right? Customers and employees are distinct constituencies. Um, each has unique needs and desired outcomes. Uh, and sometimes these are, these are competing, right? Uh, and certainly they are competing uh, for limited company resources in order to accomplish their outcomes. So the key to most effectively leveraging both our voice of employee and voice of customer programs and to most optimally investing organizational resources is to find those sweet spots where EX and CX overlap and where they intersect. So again, before we can talk about the impact that employee experience can have on customer experience, those of us who have historically spent our careers in CX are going to, be, are going to benefit by doing a deeper dive into employee experience to explore and learn more about this side of the equation. To do this deep dive, uh, and Tom has introduced my, my uh, friends here on the phone, but I'm joined by Betsy Woods-Brooks and Scott Marcotte from Buck uh, in HR and Benefits Consulting, Technology and Administration Services firm with a 100 year history. And when we think about how to most effectively link customer and employee programs, we know it takes data and it takes programming on both sides of the CX and EX coin. Merit CX and Buck both bring the experience, technology, and most importantly, the people first approach to building these programs and driving business outcomes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Betsy to talk to us about the new social contract. Well, great. Thank you, Stacy, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think at this point, we can all agree that the customer experience is deeply dependent upon your employees and the relationship they have with your customers. And creating a great customer experience, it doesn't happen by accident. It starts with ensuring that your employees are well equipped to project a positive image of your company and its services, but even more so that they're passionate about representing your brand. So we believe that this passion starts with the social contract or the, uh, the agreement that exists between an organization and its people. And this idea of the employer-employee contract, is, it's not a new one, but it's time that we rethink traditional approaches. Uh, you know, I still have this uh, vivid memory of my dad getting up at the same time every morning, putting on the percolator to brew some coffee. You know, he'd read the morning paper, get dressed and leave for the office in his suit and tie. And he did this every day for 30 years at the same company. And when he retired, he had a nice party and an even nicer pension. But of course, Today, things have changed. Uh, people have, on average, 12 jobs over the course of their careers. Corporate cultures are more casual to meet the needs of a very diverse workforce. Uh, technology allows us to work when and wherever we want, and pensions are all but gone. So it's time for companies to take a fresh approach and define a new social contract. So here's how the new social contract works. It starts with companies investing in their people through programs and resources that attract the talent that they need to achieve their business goals. If the programs are well designed to meet people's needs, employees will see the value and they'll be on board with what the company has to offer. Then with supportive tools and resources, 
employees are able to take advantage of the company's offerings in a personalized way that's meaningful to them. And at the same time, companies benefit from an enhanced brand that makes a company more desirable uh, to, to work at and to do business with. So when this offer works, your employees are more engaged, they're better able to deliver on your mission, and in turn, the company is better able to succeed in achieving its business uh, results. So that's the new social contract that elevates business success. But of course, every organization is different. Um, so what's right for one company may not be right for another. So how does an organization determine where to best make their investment in their people? The answer lies in understanding the needs and challenges of your workforce. So Buck conducts a global uh, working wealth study of employers around the world. And this research provides insights about the top issues facing the workforce today. So I'll just share a few of the, the highlights from our research. Um, our first finding falls in the category of physical health. Um, employers are reporting that stress is the number one issue facing their employees today. Um, as we know, stress is linked to all sorts of health issues, um, anxiety and depression, back pain, cardiovascular issues, and, and much more. So the direct cost of stress and related health conditions, as well as the indirect cost of absenteeism and lost productivity is staggering. So it's really in the best interest of companies to look for ways to alleviate that stress, provide support for mental and emotional health, and teach new techniques for resiliency. Our second finding is very much related to the first, and that is that a majority of employees today are living paycheck to paycheck. As a result, employers are responding by investing in financial education programs uh, to help people manage their debt, set budgets, learn about investing and saving. And then they're also looking at programs to help ease the burden of current needs, things like student debt reduction, discount programs, and more. The bottom line here is that it's hard to focus on customer needs when you're stressed out, sick, or worried about paying the rent. So alleviating these, current, these concerns is at the heart of the new social contract. Employers also understand that employees want to work for companies that care about their well-being. And to that end, companies view total well-being as key to their employee value proposition to gain that competitive advantage and as a critical part of their brand identity. And then finally, um, employers are looking to, to technology uh, to enable their well-being initiatives, and Scott's going to share more about that in a few minutes. Okay. So focusing on wellness in the workplace, it, it's not a new concept. It's been around for decades, but certainly evolved over time. Initially, the focus was on promoting healthy behaviors, like getting preventive checkups, but there was little done to track or measure the outcomes of those efforts. As healthcare costs started to skyrocket, employers looked to control costs. So they introduced a, a variety of techniques uh, and tactics, uh, things like incentives aimed at identifying and circumventing high-cost claims through things like biometric health screenings and health coaching. Most recently, the focus has now shifted to promoting well-being as a way to drive organizational performance. So there's a much greater focus on creating healthy environments where people can thrive and do their best work. All of this is supported by personalized technologies and communications that deliver relevant, timely, and personalized messaging so that we can get information to the right people at the right time and in the right way. So at the end of the day, it's about helping employees to be their best so they in turn can support the company's mission, deliver great service, and take care of our customers. This trend, um, it was just recently validated in this quote from one of America's top CEOs. And uh, just for a little fun, see if you can identify who made this statement. The American dream is alive but fraying. Major employers are investing in their workers and communities because they know it's the only way to be successful over the long term. These modernized principles reflect the business community's unwavering commitment 
to continue to push for an economy that serves all Americans. Okay, so let's see who said that. Okay, if you guessed Jamie Dimon, you're correct. Um, he is the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase and a member of the Business Roundtable, which includes CEOs from top employers who come together to discuss policy issues that impact the economy. And this statement came, back, came out in August, and it really shook up the business world. You know, for decades, shareholders were king. And with this one statement, there's a seismic shift in how companies perceive the value of various stakeholders to their success. In fact, the statement went on to list the constituents that drive value for organizations. So here's another pop quiz. See if you can place them in the order by which the statement lists them. So while each of the stakeholders is essential, the statement acknowledged that the best run companies put customers first, and they also invest in their employees and in their communities. So given this shift, it makes sense that companies invest in and create environments that support the total well-being of the workforce. And you know, we touched on a few of these essential elements uh, a bit earlier, but here's an expanded definition from a Gallup study that identifies five, it identifies five key pillars of well-being. Um, and they include good physical health through preventive care, wellness activities, and managing chronic conditions. And financial health, helping people to stay on track to meet their financial goals, while at the same time having the wherewithal to enjoy life. Career well-being includes understanding one's role in the organization and the contribution that they make to fulfilling the mission, as well as seeing a path for growth and development. The last two elements are social and community well-being. And these speak to having strong relationships and a sense of engagement at, both at home and at work. So as, as we work with companies and we design workplace well-being programs, we often look at the culture, the infrastructure, communications, and technology that are available to support this concept of total well-being. To create sustainable employee engagement, well-being should be the lens through which every interaction between the employer and employee is viewed. So let's, let's look at an example um, of how one employer revitalized their social contract. The state fund is a quasi-governmental organization that offers workers' compensation to employers in California. They were having difficulty um, recruiting the talent that they needed to provide excellent customer service. So they wanted to enhance and strengthen their employee value proposition, or EVP. So we worked with them to answer the question, what does the state fund need from employees to be successful today and in the future? And what is the state fund offering in return to attract, retain, and motivate the talent that they need? So as part of this process, we gathered perceptions on the strengths and weaknesses of the current employee value proposition as well as potential areas uh, for future enhancements. And we share these, these findings in a workshop that we held with leadership, HR, corporate communications, and marketing to identify and prioritize specific next steps for enhancing their EVP. So as you can see here, um, we developed an employee value proposition statement that answers the question, why work at State Fund? This piece highlights the key elements of a total well-being strategy, which for them included mission, culture, rewards, training, and career development. And then we developed a roadmap uh, to track quick hits, shorter-term, and longer-term enhancement activities. The employee value proposition is now used to remind people about the value of working for state fund. It's also used by their recruiters to attract the talent that they need, and it's used to encourage their employees to deliver the brand promise to their customers. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Scott, and he'll tell us more about making the social contract come to life. All right. Thanks, Betsy, and hi, everybody. Uh, State Fund, is, it's a great example of how to make that social contract real. So thank you uh, for sharing that, Betsy. I'm, I'm going to take the next few minutes to talk about more of the process on how to make that come to life for your own 
organizations. And I want to reinforce a, a key point that Betsy covered up front, that it's, it's truly all about helping an individual achieve their own health, their wealth, their career goals. If we can do that, we know the individual thrives and so does the organization. So in order to uh, you know, really get that and, and help it come to life, we know to, to reach that audience, to engage that audience, we need to make that experience for them truly personally relevant. We need to understand what motivates our workforce, what's meaningful to them. Even the channel and the tone become so critical. The more we can make it personal, the more impact we're going to have. So market segmentation gives us a, a great place to start in understanding our internal audiences and, and moving to that personalization. So even if we look at just generational segmentations, we, we have five in the workplace now. This uh, graphic gives a, a great perspective on, on how the U.S. workforce is morphing and really how quickly it's morphing as well. We, we've heard for so many years that about the rise of the millennials, the Gen, the Gen Yers, and also the Gen Zers who are quickly following that you know, they're, they're coming into the workforce in a big way. Well, they're, they're clearly here, and they already represent nearly half the workforce in America, which is just staggering. For roughly three decades, you know, this, the boomer and Gen Xers have had a conspiracy in many ways on, on using email, using conference calls to get work done, that, that classic version of work that Betsy's dad enjoyed for so many years. It's changing. You know, that, that paradigm is shifting now, and we're seeing Slack and Microsoft Teams and other work collaboration tools driving a, a, a different way that people work on a day-to-day -day basis. So how can we as employers predict this impact that these generational shifts are, are having on our own organizations and accounting for the needs of all these different uh, generations within the organization? How will we know what skills are retiring as the boomers retire, as the Xers ascend to senior management, and as the millennials and Gen Zers take over the uh, workplace? Yet we believe it's critical to mine our own organizational data to better understand these audiences and create experiences that both resonate and are personally relevant to deliver on that social contract that Betsy talked about. So how would we go about analyzing it? You know, this, this slide's a lot of information, but it gives you a bit of a feel for how we might review the issues, review the needs, review even the intervention opportunities for various segments within our workforce. This approach we'd suggest taking would, would be to look at your current workforce split, understand where it is now, and project out that likely split over the next few years as well to get a sense for how the dynamics within the organization are changing. Then we'd suggest looking at how these various segments consume your rewards program specifically. For example, how much uh, various groups spend on uh, out of health care, out of pocket health care, how, how well they are saving for their future, what's on their mind for career concerns or opportunities. So like really any good marketing approach, this assures we understand as much as we can about each of these audiences before we look to engage them. And then really the next step is to marry this organizational data with what we know about generational attitudes and preferences. Uh, for example, we know that all audiences appreciate personal relevance, of course, but boomers tend to appreciate relevance to their rewards and uh, their uh, impact to the bottom line, while millennials might often focus on relevance to their role and career opportunities and where their future might lie. So we can also get a sense for what channels will likely have the highest impact, such as you know, maybe email for messages that might most likely resonate with boomers and, and Gen Xers and texts uh, for, for millennials. Uh, of course, th these are just generalized starting points, though, uh, because as we see how individuals actually consume information and react to messaging, we have to learn from it and learn from those interactions and adjust the channels and even the content accordingly. And, and this reinforces that employee experience can't be a one-size-fits-all. Instead, it has to be an internal customer relationship management approach you know, that we know so well on the CX side. We need to apply that same kind of methodology for the EX side. It needs to continually adjust based on how these various audiences actually consume the messaging we're putting in front of them. So while generational analyses give us a great starting point, to take it a, maybe even a step further, Certainly this uh, emerging approach of, of using personas has a, a lot of value. It gives us a chance to consider strategies to meet the needs of, of, of these various audience segments in, in more deeper segmentation. And we recommend building these types of personas based on the workforce segments that you're looking to recruit or retain, uh, completely stepping into their shoes to understand what makes them tick, what their needs are, what they're, they're hoping to achieve in, in their relationship with you, the employer. 
you know, for example, we may look to engage a millennial earlier early career uh, type of a persona with uh, things like personalized guidance uh, delivered by a trusted advisor, easy button answers, uh, telling them briefly but concisely what they need to know and, and what they need to do next, uh, keeping a focus on support for their career growth, but with truly a high degree of flexibility. We know that these are important starting points uh, that work well for, for many in the segment. But much like the generational analysis, uh, these persona models can be an effective starting point for personal relevance, but they should only be used as, as guideposts and, and as that starting point to, to how they most likely will reach an individual. Because if we overgeneralize, we, we risk alienating our audience. And um, a great example, even in my own house, I've got two daughters, couldn't be more different in how they consume media. My 13-year-old fits the, the Gen Z model of uh, digital native. She's got her mobile phone in her hands at all times. She's all about the latest gadget and all about sharing her social status. My 15-year-old, completely different. Uh, like uh, Betsy's dad, uh, she reads the paper with me each morning and uh, prefers to turning actual pages in a book to swiping some digital interface. She sees her mobile device as a necessary evil in some ways, using it pretty much just in that very 20th century way of making phone calls. So we, we use technology, we use channels very differently. The more we can learn about the individual, the more we're truly going to make it personally relevant uh, to them. And if we're not hitting the mark, maybe getting that opportunity or a chance to, to pivot if we aren't doing that. So as you can tell, the, the more we refine, the more we're truly heading to an audience of one. True personalization that uses all data that we might have available to create a, a almost hyper-relevant experience. So going back to that World at Work survey that uh, Betsy referenced, we found that 84% felt that predictive analytics using the broad breadth of personal health, wealth, career data that employers have at their fingertips is, is very highly effective, yet only 27% are using predictive analytics now. Uh, we see this as a great opportunity to gather these uh, talent, engagement, physical health, financial data points of that employee population to get a complete handle on the issues and needs of the workforce, along with that of the talent you're going to need in years to come. We see this data being used to both guide HR program design and even service delivery in line with the talent and the expectations that they have. And the other big finding that we saw is that comprehensive portals, decision support tools, and the like are, are very effective and high on the list to be implemented over the next few years. With all of that health, wealth, career, and engagement data, we can gather not only for organizational benefit, but we can also provide it back to the individual for that personal relevance that we're talking about. In the next two to three years, we'd suggest looking at tools that create this uh, almost holistic, unified experience for both uh, the employee and for the employer. So, uh, so what, what might this look like? What, what might a, an aggregated unified experience be? Here's an example of, of what we typically build for, for clients. And in this case, every aspect of an individual's personal employer-sponsored health, wealth, career, and work experience is brought together in one place. It's, it's their personal dashboard in many ways. Action lists are targeted to that individual based on, on the data that we know about them. Reminders go out to that individual proactively so they don't have to come to the site and expect to, to, to come here only when they need information. We can proactively push information through this out to uh, the channel that they prefer, text, email, even print in some cases. And then workflow behind the scenes uh, for events like onboarding, offboarding, family status changes, job changes, can incorporate you know, really all the steps that they need to take uh, to get to that end state with the underlying systems that might serve it up. So direct, direct linkage, single sign-on to any um, system that's within the organization, and even third-party systems as well. So, for example, to gather engagement data, uh, there might be a direct link to a, uh, a merit engagement survey, which we can uh, bring directly into the experience here, too, and, uh, and with it um, have a pulse survey at any point in time to gather feedback on, on really any of the elements of the health, wealth, career, or working experience, uh, engagement experience of, of that individual. And, and similarly, uh, for that uh, individual, we can further see the personal impact on customer experience, kind of tying back to where we started this conversation at the start of the day. Uh, that manager, in this case, may see their client's engagement score alongside their team's engagement score. And this dashboard could then lead to truly deep metrics on, on both 
employee and customer experience. You know, and some of those metrics here um, might be a service center manager, for example, seeing, seeing the impact of her team's engagement scores and how those scores correlate with the engagement scores of the clients that her team serves. Uh, trends can help identify areas that are improving or declining and can even serve as a powerful feedback opportunity for that manager to have discussions with their direct reports. So while all this type of analysis can help both the individual and organization better understand the direct impact of employee experience on customer experience, I'd like to turn it back to Stacy to share how uh, Merits is, is seeing this correlation kind of across the industry in some of the research that they're doing. So uh, Stacy, back over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Scott. And thanks both to you, Scott and Betsy, uh, for that great insight into the employee side of the EX CX equation, as I, as I keep referring to it. Um, Betsy, you noted uh, very uh, uh, appropriately that the workplace and the workforce, they don't look like they did when your dad was, was in, the, in the workforce. Um, and, and I would say that that, is, that holds true even for just a decade ago. Um, and Scott, you talked about how the personalization of employee experience, just as it is in customer experience, is growing ever more important. Uh, so we really appreciate you guys uh, helping helping share some of those some of those insights and approaches that are that uh, organizations are finding successful. Uh, we're really grateful for the experience that you were able to share. <clears throat> Knowing that uh, customers and employees and their expectations are all rapidly evolving. Uh, we at Merit CX uh, wanted to take our own crack at updating our insights that we had related to customer experience and employee experience. And uh, in this large, very large uh, global study that we did, uh, both in 2016 and 2018, uh, we wanted to hear, we sought to hear from practitioners what they felt were critical factors uh, which enabled them to generate ROI with their CX program. <clears throat> so, Lo and behold, <laughs> probably not shocking to anyone, people, uh, employees, emerged as one of those key factors. Um, but even more interesting, uh, in fact, was the key finding that not a single factor or a single key capability could affect ROI and CX as much as the right combination of factors. Um, and, and some of which you see here on the slide when we're talking about the organization's uh, CX strategy, business strategy, uh, processes, and the enablement of employees to execute on that strategy. So not only is EX critical to CX success, but it's also interwoven uh, with other key drivers of CX uh, success. So what this means uh, really at the end of the day is that employees and their engagement, and in fact their full employment experience, is an inherent part of all things CX and must be treated as such instead of uh, as, as part of its own silo. When we conducted this study, uh, we also found that uh, companies fell into essentially one of four stages of CX success. Some uh, you know, just beginning their journey to organizations who were truly proactive and innovative in the way that they approach the experience of their customers. And we've hopefully at this point <laughs> made the case that customer experience and employee experience are inextricably linked, right? Therefore, it probably doesn't surprise you that when you look at those companies that are most successful in their CX programs, nearly all of them are leveraging voice of employee as a part of that holistic program. And it makes logical sense. Right. Uh, if if employees, I said this earlier, if employees aren't happy, customers aren't happy and often vice versa. And our study uh, was able to quantify that relationship between a, a customer and employee NPS as well. So what does this relationship look like in practice? Because we can talk all day long about the research and the data and in theory how this should happen. But what does it look like in practice? Uh, part of this study's uh, insights were a whole series of best practices uh, that we heard from organizations uh, that they are employing to make this connection between CX and EX. And some of those best practices are noted here on this slide, and they show that manifestation of the link between EX and CX. And we can see again that those with more mature CX programs understand that they have to make business decisions that incorporate both the customer and the employee voice. 
So to wrap up our session, we'll end with the literal bottom line <laughs> of our CX Evolution study. Uh, we found tangible business impact when companies invested in EX as a part of their CX program. And through today's session, we hope that not only you learn new insight uh, regarding employee experience and well-being, but that you also found some inspiration that can be used to engage more collaboratively with CX and HR partners within your own organization. So thank you again for the attention and for joining us today. And Tom, I will turn it back to you. Hey, great. Thanks, Stacy, and thanks to Betsy and Scott as well. Um, we appreciate the insight and all the effort that went into developing the content for today's presentation. So I'm, I'm certain our audience learned a lot, very relatable content. And um, it looks like we do have um, some questions that have come in. So let's get to those right now. And Stacy, if you can stay queued up, this first one is for you. Um, all right. Our company has been doing a biannual employee engagement survey for many years, but there's been talk about expanding the program. What are some things we should consider in this process? Yeah, that's uh, it's a question I hear actually quite frequently, Tom. Uh, so thanks. I'm I'm glad that it has come up, and I think that it's key to recognize that. While employees and customers are different stakeholders for a company, as I mentioned earlier, all with unique needs, uh, with unique desired outcomes, um, there are a lot of similarities when it comes to designing impactful programs that target each of those of those different stakeholders. Um, and we often think uh, so often of, of how we think of the differences rather than the similarities. And so in my response to this question, I'm going to focus on uh, the similarities. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we need to understand what not only the current state of employee experience is, um, and, and you heard both Scott and Betsy talk about this, uh, but what we desire it to be and what insight we have or we don't have to help inform this. Um, second, uh, just as customers are uh, more willing to give feedback if they know it's being listened to and acted upon, so is the case with employees. Um, in fact, perhaps even more so uh, because employees have a daily lens into how leaders are walking the talk or how they aren't doing that which customers don't have. Um, this, this principle of relevant and timely insight uh, is just as important for employees uh, as it is for customers, as is the idea of closing the loop. Um, so especially if uh, organizations have been successful closing the loop for customers, it's really justified that employees expect they will be able to do the same for the employees, uh, right? Because they know that the organization has been successful. So as it is with customer programs, uh, I would say that organizations who want to do employee experience right um, and bring about a measurable impact not only on employees but also on customers, they need to be prepared to leverage their program insights as a starting point and not the end goal. Uh, so when designing that program, it's, it's going to be important to do so with the idea of driving action, bringing about change, um, and that change is, is likely going to have to involve more than just establishing something like casual Fridays. <laughs> so hmm. Thanks for the question, Tom. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, Scott, this one may be for you. So in the U.S., do you – this person wants to know, in the U.S., do you keep abreast of the Canadian standard on psychological health and safety, uh, particularly in regard to psychosocial factors that contribute to a psychological safe and healthy work? Workplace. Do you know the answer? Uh, to that? And I, I, I can certainly address it. Yeah, we we have, as you might imagine, a pretty significant uh, consulting group in Canada as well, who stays very close to uh, the Canadian standard on psychological health and safety. It's uh, it, it truly is a sound base to assist in um, you know protecting the mental health of employees. So we know how impo important it is uh, for employers in Canada, and actually a lot of those standards have great relevance in the U.S. and globally as well. So we uh, bring them in as much as we can into our online experience, but also uh, consider the reference to them as we um, communicate with end users, with uh, employees and even uh, family members uh, and, and the services that organizations might provide. So we, the, to answer the question directly, not just in the U.S., but, but certainly through our Canadian um, practice, uh, we spend a lot of time looking at that and the application of it in the workforce, especially in Canada, but certainly global as well. Nice. Um, thank you for answering that. 
Uh, let's throw in the Betsy. Um, Betsy, what you said about the new social contract, it, it makes sense, but what guidance can you provide to companies that have limited financial resources to offer a compelling, a compelling package? Yeah, that's a it's a great question because you know every organization would love to do everything for their people. You know, it's just sometimes it's a matter of you know financial constraints or, or limits. So you have to really look at what you're doing today and make the most of what you have. Um, you know, I, I guess one piece of advice I'd, I'd give is to inventory all of your plans and programs. And you know, make sure that your managers are equipped to help promote them. Um, not that they need to be experts, but frequently people aren't aware of what's available to them. I can't tell you the number of times I've done focus groups with employees, and they're just not aware or familiar with everything that that is currently available to them. So help your managers be supportive of your message. Um, another issue sometimes is just reaching people. Um, you know, we've worked with organizations that have you know, seemingly done a great job of communicating their plans and programs, but when you talk with employees, they're still unfamiliar with them. So you need to understand the best way to get that information into people's hands. And sometimes it's just getting your managers up to speed so that when they have informal conversations or, or huddle meetings, they can, you know, they can be your voice. Um, another thing I would say is, again, related to communication is, it, sometimes it's just the way you package and communicate a program that can have a, a great impact on, um, you know, on your uh, on understanding of, of what's available. Um, so we've seen situations where we're not changing benefits, we're not changing plans, um, but purely through more effective communication you're seeing uh, higher engagement scores among employees because they're now familiar with what's available to them. So just a few tips there. Hopefully that'll help. Okay, great. Um, Stacy. are there certain questions that can be asked on both VOE and VOC surveys that we can tie employee and customer experience together, um, showing alignment relationship between employees and customers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in fact, uh, we have this conversation quite frequently <laughs> with, with our clients. Um, and surprisingly enough, for those organizations that currently run VOE and VOC programs, you likely already have questions built in that can be leveraged for, for this, this type of insight. So let, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, from a key KPI standpoint, absolutely, there are questions that can be phrased similarly um, on the employee and customer side to better understand the the linkage between the two, right? And I and I referenced that in my slides. I talked about the employee and and customer um, NPS. But if we're going to actually act upon these data points, we need to look a little bit more deeply. And one of the ways uh, we see organizations who are doing this well um, consider this, this idea is by having questions uh, in their, whether it's via pulse survey, whether it is incorporated within their uh, annual or semi-annual engagement study, but these questions around service delivery and uh, getting the, that voice of employee perspective on how they feel that customer experience is being delivered. Um, we also know uh, that even leveraging standard engagement uh, type uh, question constructs can provide some really good insight when bumped up against uh, voice of employee or excuse me voice of customer studies. So let me give you an example here. Um, <clears throat> this is more of a contact center uh, example uh, because it's a, it's your customer facing area uh, and provides really rich fodder. <laughs> Um, but when we talk about uh, a contact center, uh, the voice of customer s surveys will, will, could frequently come back with uh, drivers related to whether or not the rep was knowledgeable, uh, and then uh, KPIs such as first call resolution are often measured. If we also had a voice of employee uh, survey that was done, uh, even in the engagement survey, and we chose to bump those data sets up against each other, we might realize that employees within the contact center function 
actually note that they don't feel empowered and that they don't feel they have the right training, support, and skills in order to, uh, to successfully execute on, on the purpose of their role. And so, again, uh, I'll come back to where I started, which was if organizations already have an employee experience program and a customer experience program in place, a really good first step is to ha begin having conversations across those silos and talking about what data is already gathered and what those linkages might be, which then helps us identify uh, what gaps there might be in our data sources as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Stacy. Sounds like you've answered that a couple times before. So, good stuff. <laughs> um, hey, Scott, let's go to you for this one. Um, Okay, consolidating every aspect of an employee's experience seems daunting. Is there an easy way to uh, get started on that? Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to play off what uh, Stacey just shared and what Betsy shared earlier, too. Yeah, inventorying what's out there, I think, is, is so important in that first step and, and understanding the breadth of programs available to that individual, whether they're designed to help the learning and development of that person, to help their psychological needs on the EAP side with mental health, whether they're available to them for their health benefits or financial benefits, just helping the organization and the individual be aware of all that is there is a great starting point. So understanding that breadth doesn't necessarily require, and where it can get taunting, the gathering of all the data before you launch something. Just helping bring it together from a high-level perspective, helping an individual see what's all available to them can help them be assured that they've got access to resources and over time build in increased data gathering, increased single sign-on to third-party systems, increased transactional interaction with those third-party systems. All of that can be built over time, but really starting with that, that overarching inventory and, and maybe even creating some of those key personal information uh, points that we know are going to drive eyeballs and, and people to uh, the experience. Those things can be um, in the individual's pay, can be uh, paid time off, can be maybe their personal benefits, the uh, benefits that they've enrolled in or the balances that they have in various plans. But some, some nuggets of information that are personal and relevant to help capture their attention and then over time build more and more into that. You know, some of our uh, clients have 40 different data sources coming in on an almost immediate real-time basis, uh, that can be daunting for any organization to, to attack. Maybe just to, starting with a handful, but truly understanding at least the inventory of what's available is probably the right way to start. Okay, great. Very helpful. And then <clears throat> Betsy, more of kind of an HR recruitment um, sorry, um, question about attracting millennials to, their or, to a per, this person's organization. Uh, what's the best way to determine the right mix of plans and programs for doing that? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a, another great question. Um, and as we're meeting with clients, we hear that a lot, you know, trying to attract millennials to our organization. You know, how do we do that? Um, and I can tell you there's no, you know, one size fit all, fits all answer to that question because every organization is so unique in terms of their business goals, their you know, their culture, the makeup of their workforce today, um, you know, the way that they communicate. So there are some things that you can do, though, to really get to that place where you have that right mix of plans and programs that are going to attract that, um, you know, that demographic that you're seeking, um, and also to kind of retain the talent that you, that you need for the future. Um, so, you know, I think it starts with really – understanding the current state of your organization um, and, and your people. So some of the, the things that uh, Scott described earlier in terms of looking at your um, workforce demographics today as well as the demographics of the, the um, employees that you want to uh, attract to your organization, looking at your organizational data, um, understanding what works today and what doesn't. You know, what are the what are the programs that are pe that people are really taking advantage of, and what you know what is going by the wayside? So it's really doing that diagnostic to understand what's effective and what's not, um, and then exploring um, new new things that um, 
that you think will work, but then testing them, right? So, you know, doing um, an employee survey through merits or employee focus groups can provide you with some really rich data on people's preferences and what they value. Um, and, you know, oftentimes when we do this kind of diagnostic, we find that there may be programs that you're paying for, but you're not really getting the bang for your buck because people don't value them or they're, they're just not needed. Um, you know, I think about like tobacco cessation programs, which, you know, if you, you look at a certain organization, they may not have a lot of smokers. So that may not be the place to, to invest in. It may be something else that's really needed by by your organization. So, you know, going through this diagnostic process um, can give you a really good understanding of what people want and what they need um, so that you can get to the right mix of, of plans and programs for the company. Okay, perfect. Um, if you're out there and you have a question uh, and you want to ask, go ahead. Uh, we just have one more question, submitted question, uh, that we'll ask in just a second. Before we do, you'll see for more information, you can contact any of our three speakers, Stacy, Betsy, or Scott. The email contact information is there. So if you have a question you want to ask them uh, directly, go ahead and um, get that email and send that question to them. So um, let's we, our one last question, um, and I think this is um, – this would be Scott, I believe. Some of the info displayed in the example site you showed um, seems very personal. How do you overcome trust issues? Uh, yeah, that's a, a good and tough question. Yeah, the, the trust consideration. You know, we I think we all know that trust is earned. It's not something that's uh, expected. It, it's something that the organization certainly already has to have to some degree with their employees and uh, and with trust you can provide more and more information. And I know this is even a, a challenge in the, the CX side. How personal is too personal? How far can we go? Obviously, to the extent we can help that individual help themselves achieve their physical, financial, professional, uh, social goals, obviously it's a, it's a great win for them. The fact that we have so much data on behalf of that individual means that there's almost an obligation on our end to provide it to them so that they are making informed decisions around it. So it's best probably first to under, understand the degree of trust within the organization. How, how comfortable are people with the, the trust that, that emanates within the, uh, the leadership all the way down to managers uh, within the organization? And then, then of course, tread very carefully uh, around that. Uh, even when we think about recommendations we might put in front of the individual, we tend to classify them more as considerations as, as opposed to a, a suggestion or a recommendation or here's a consideration for you, something to think about that might help you avoid loss, you know, the opportunity perhaps to take advantage of this 401k match that you haven't been, uh, money on the table, those uh, behavioral economics uh, concepts that, that can help the individual realize we're doing this on their best behalf. All of the interaction is really with the intent of helping them achieve their goals. When that happens, of course, even in a more subtle way, we build increasing trust and have that opportunity to dialogue with that person in a personal and a, a, in a trusted way. But it does have to be earned. So it's a tough question, but a, a wonderful uh, opportunity for our organizations to, to build trust in the right direction to truly help that individual and help essentially at the end make that social contract come to life. Perfect. Thanks, Scott. And with that, we're going to uh, end today's presentation a little bit early, but uh, all good. So I want to thank um, our presenters, Scott, Betsy, and Stacy. Great stuff. And uh, thank you all for joining the webinar today and hope we'll uh, see you again soon at the, on the next Merit CX webcast. So uh, with that, we hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all.